Welcome, everyone. My name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. And we're thrilled to have a great audience here today, uh, both in the room and online. Uh, welcome to everyone. Um, this, uh, really looking forward to today's discussion. We've got a, a great panel, um, wonderful moderator, and uh, this is a uh, part of the Sabin Prize, uh, venture, Sabin Venture Prize Speaker Series. And this event in particular is uh, co-sponsored between the Yale Center for Business and the Environment and the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute, we have uh, some of the leaders of that organization here today, Jim and Elena, if you guys could raise your hands. Um, for folks in the room who are interested in entrepreneurship and want to build a business, uh, start a venture while at Yale, uh, this is the best uh, place to go first to get all the resources, ideas, um, the, the roadmap for how you go about doing this. And this event is part of the ecosystem that we're building at Yale to support environmental ventures. So the Sabin Sustainable Venture Prize Speaker Series is a component of the Sabin Prize, which is a $25,000 winner-take-all prize that's awarded every April to a business on campus, a startup that's really pushing an innovative way to develop to make a profit and to improve uh, environmental performance. And so this is a, a year-long competition and opportunity for students to engage. Uh, also in the fall, and the applications for this are due on October 28th, we have idea, a concept in mind that you want to be able to move forward. We have funding support available for those types of ventures uh, for people to be able to put that on paper, get mentorship advice, uh, and support from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. So this event and the coalescing ecosystem around here, we really hope we can help foster those innovative ideas which can ultimately make an impact in the wider world. Um, so, uh, you know, this discussion, um, uh, transportation in America, uh, um, environmental and mobility trends, um, we're really lucky in this case to have a uh, professor at the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies who is really one of the global leaders on figuring out and understanding how uh, urbanization uh, comes together in transportation issues and how you ultimately look at some of the, the solutions that, that can come out of this interaction. Uh, so I uh, would love to introduce uh, Karen Sito, who's a professor of geography and urbanization at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She is an expert in urbanization dynamics, forecasting urban growth, and examining the environmental consequences of urban expansion. She's pioneered methods using satellite remote sensing to reconstruct past patterns of urbanization and to develop projections of future urban expansion. Uh, in particular of note right now, Professor Sito serves on a number of international and national scientific advisory committees, including as the coordinating lead author for the IPCC Fifth Assessment Report, uh, coordinating lead author for the UN Convention on Biodiversity, Cities, and Biodiversity Outlook, and co-chair of the IHDP Urbanization and Global Environmental Change Project. Uh, she's a, a wonderful collaborator at Yale and has really been uh, quite generous with her time to the center, and we're thrilled to have her moderating this discussion. So I'd like to invite Karen up to introduce our speakers. Well, thank you, Stuart. Well, I'm really delighted to moderate the session today. Uh, from my vantage point, I think there's probably no single issue more important than transportation and how transportation links with urbanization. Um, as many of you know, uh, transportation systems and transportation infrastructure is really the backbone of many cities. And over the next 20 to 30 years, as we see the global urban population uh, expected to double in size, uh, some projections show even uh, uh, more than doubling in size, what we're going to see in many developing countries, especially in Asia and in Africa, is the development of new transportation systems, uh, uh, renovation of existing infrastructure, and, and I think that uh, it, it, it cannot be underscored the, the really overwhelming opportunities for innovation in this sector, probably more than any other sector. This is probably debatable whether it's in the energy sector or in the transportation sector. Um, one of the trends that we've seen in the United States that has been uh, spilling over to other countries over the last 50 years is this trend where in the US, people generally or increasingly live in a city where they don't work, or in other words, they work in a place different from where they live. 
And this, uh, this separation of uses, separation of where people live from where they work, really locks in certain types of infrastructure in terms of transportation. Um, what we have seen in uh, cities that have really innovative transportation infrastructure and technologies are a, uh, a tighter mix of where people live and where they work. And so when we see increased uh, uses or increased mixture of uses with increased density, that's where we see really innovation uh, in terms of the types of transportation, uh, the modes of transportation that they can use. So I'm really delighted uh, to hear about um, the innovations and uh, new ideas that are coming out of the private sector in today's talks. A few statistics that I think just to set the stage in terms of uh, the importance of the transportation industry in terms of the environment. Um, over the last 35 years, uh, the global transport sector's energy use has increased on average every year at about 2.5%. So that 2.5% increase in energy use every year pretty much parallels uh, global economic growth. And so we can see that over the next 30 to 40 years as uh, developing countries, as urbanization really takes off in developing countries, as we see more economic development in these developing countries, we're going to really see uh, the transportation sector uh, take off. And at the same time, a lot of the legacy cities, the established cities like New Haven, San Francisco, New York, uh, we're going to see a, a, a trend towards renovation and new innovations in terms of existing uh, transportation technologies and infrastructure. So there are really two different types of opportunities and challenges in my mind. One is for these rapidly urbanizing cities. Some of these are in developing countries. Some of them are here in the United States. Uh, Las Vegas is a rapidly, still rapidly developing city. Um, and, and different types of opportunities and challenges for established cities, cities that already have their infrastructure, uh, transport infrastructure already laid out. Another statistic that I want you to keep in mind of, uh, over the course of this afternoon's uh, panel discussion is that the global transport sector currently takes up or uses about 30% of the global final energy demand. So about one third of global final energy demand goes to the transport sector. And so again, I think this, um, as uh, cities continue to develop and as infrastructure uh, uh, transport infrastructure continues to develop, we're going to see that the share can either increase or it actually may decrease depending on the types of innovation that come online uh, from the industry. So this is particularly exciting to, to, to talk about this afternoon. Well, let me introduce the two panelists that we have and then I'm, I'm going to invite uh, one of them to come up and provide some opening remarks. Um, uh, we have Mark Joseph, who's the Chief Executive Officer and Vice Chairman of Viola Transportation. Uh, Mark began his career with the Yellow Cab of Baltimore, where he served as President and CEO for 20 years. And under his leadership, Yellow Cab grew from a small local operation into a leading regional transportation company. And I think this is one of the themes we're going to see with transportation. Again, paralleling this trend where people live in a city elsewhere from where they work, uh, that transportation has to move from being really a local enterprise to maybe more of a regional, uh, a regional enterprise. As CEO of Viola, Mark has rapidly transformed the company into the largest multimodal transportation company on the continent. He has a directed dynamic expansion of bus, rail, paratransit, shuttle, taxi, and including the privatization of the New Orleans Public Transportation Authority, as well as the acquisition and expansion of Super Shuttle, which services uh, 30 airports across the United States. Mark is committed to uh, values-based leadership, safety, and sustainability, and he's dedicated to transforming and improving the quality of life in cities through well-designed and integrated transportation. Our second panelist for today is Bill Scazzi, who's the founder and president of Metro Taxi right here in our backyard. Uh, Metro Taxi is the largest full-service full taxi company in Connecticut. 
And they got to be that way, Bill says, by providing good service to our clients and beneficial contracts to our drivers, by reinvesting in Connecticut's taxi industry, and by creating opportunities that offer drivers the flexibility to meet today's two-income family. Uh, demands. And I think this is the other trend that we're going to see, that transportation is about supply, but it's also about demand. And we're going to see significant changes in both the demand side and on the supply side. Business New Haven celebrated Bill Scazzi as a 2008 rising star and his company Metro Taxi as the 2010 green business leader. So we're really uh, lucky to have Bill as a local expert uh, to talk about the taxi industry. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to invite Mark Joseph up to the stage to provide some uh, general themes setting the stage of uh, transportation. Thank you, Karen. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, am very pleased to be here. My daughter Allison is here. She's a first year at SOM. So I want to thank all of you at Yale for the unique opportunity to formally lecture her. Uh, I have the, uh, she says I have mastered the art of the informal lecture, so now for the formal lecture. So um, at Veolia, we are, we are one of the leaders in uh, environmental services, water waste management, energy and transportation. And what cities face today are a, a number of problems around the world. Uh, most of these problems cities have in common. You are well familiar with this, and these have changed in terms of priority uh, over the last few years. Uh, in the case, sadly, of air quality, air quality in, in many cities has, has taken a back seat, particularly in America, to issues about public funds and constrained budgets and how to solve problems uh, since uh, our financial crisis. But the other issues also uh, are still uh, ever-present, particularly uh, sprawl, uh, traffic uh, congestion, uh, the time we spend in traffic, as Karen mentioned, commuting from one location to another. Another area that's changed more recently is the issue of energy. Clearly, we have uh, unlocked uh, tremendous resources, which we'll talk about uh, in the U.S. Uh, but one of the things that uh, all of us are faced with is this uh, population growth that you can see uh, is dramatically increasing and has increased over the past 25 years. It's booming and it will continue to increase and this is affecting all of our uh, issues of resources. You can see in that one circle alone that more than half the world's population uh, lives in that uh, tight area. And so a lot of what we're trying to develop in terms of transportation solutions are actually being developed uh, in China or in other places uh, more rapidly than maybe uh, what we're doing here in terms of aging infrastructure, aging systems, and how we're changing our transportation. Uh, here uh, we know that uh, we have issues uh, because uh, not only are people moving to cities, but they're generally moving to the coastal cities. and so. You can see that 44% of the Earth's population lives within 90 miles of the shore. And uh, as I said earlier, no matter what your politics are, this is hitting much closer to home, sadly. And how are we going to be dealing with issues of, uh, of uh, the rising tides and warming? Uh, with regard to energy, this is one of the uh, more exciting things. And Bill will talk about uh, a practical use of, uh, of uh, clean energy in vehicles. Uh, but in fact, the U.S. generally has been slow to take advantage in the transportation sector of using clean energy. And, and we have an enormous uh, resource that you can see uh, really is growing. Uh, in particular, if you look here, uh, we're the leader in uh, current reserves. The blue represents the current reserves. So, uh, and the orange is future. So you can see China has uh, big future reserves but uh, they fall behind us in terms of current reserves, as does the rest of the world. How we tap into these uh, energy reserves and solving transportation issues uh, represents a big opportunity. Uh, this is an example of what the impact of, this is uh, rush hour where I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
the, the fact is that uh, this, is, uh, this is actually Africa, which is the fastest growing from rural to urban, but uh, many cities around the world are facing this kind of uh, traffic congestion uh, and, uh, and uh, impact on the quality of life. Just uh, quickly, uh, uh, some of the older solutions actually are some of the newer solutions, and, and you can see uh, the impact of using bus, uh, buses, both in terms of less CO2 and also in terms of uh, less traffic. Uh, the unfortunate thing for the developed world in many cases, particularly in the US, uh, not so much in Europe where you have uh, high density uh, markets with lots of people who are used to uh, riding public transportation, uh, but here in the US, the, the transportation systems, bus systems in particular, are more used by people who are transportation dependent uh, than uh, new users. And we're trying to solve this problem because you can see all the advantages of bus, not only in terms of the fuel, uh, but also the uh, impact on uh, congestion, uh, the favorable impact on, on congestion. Here's a, a great story where, a, and one of the issues that Karen has raised and we'll discuss later, is what do you do in markets that already have uh, fully developed infrastructure or aging infrastructure? How can you change uh, those, uh, those markets? It takes a tremendous political uh, will to do that. In the case of Bogota, Colombia, uh, in the 90s, uh, there was a, a huge population density, 10 million people. It's one of the great examples of, of changing a very cost-effective system, BRT, bus rapid transit, some of you are familiar with that. We operate BRT systems, including this one in, in Colombia. Uh, there were 28,000 buses that uh, were uh, operated by thousands of companies with no organized system. Uh, travel times were uh, very inefficient. Boarding was very inefficient. Service uh, wasn't great. Uh, and there was uh, tremendous pollution and accidents. And there was a commitment uh, to build a BRT system that would completely revolutionize transportation uh, in Bogota. And what happened is the system was built uh, with headways, uh, uh, but one, the distance between one bus and the next bus of 90 seconds, uh, which is remarkable. The cost to build this BRT system using dedicated lanes, which is one of the advantages of BRT. If you're in a bus rapid transit, in, like we operate in, in uh, Las Vegas or in New York, just outside of Toronto or in, uh, or in uh, Bogota, if you have dedicated roadway, then the vehicles can travel very quickly. Uh, in other cities, you might have synchronization with lights and light preferences where the lights will change, uh, as we do in Toronto, for buses. But as long as we can travel fast, it's enormously attractive. The other attraction is the cost to build. Eight million dollars per mile to build versus, this says a thousand times, that's probably subway, there may be examples of that. But uh, a rail tunnel uh, uh, for a typical train is $100 million uh, a mile, and structure about $50 million uh, a mile. So uh, when you see this boarding system, all of its off-bus uh, off boarding, prepaid, you jump on the vehicle and go, level boarding so you can step right from the platform onto the bus, and you can see how we avoid the traffic congestion in Bogota. And the impact is that we transport over 1.7 million passengers each day uh, with a 43% drop in air pollution, 32% uh, decrease in travel time, uh, and it really has transformed uh, the city. Uh, it's enormous success. Here in Bordeaux, where we operated for many, many years, uh, the problem was what to do about traffic congestion. There was uh, a call for a uh, for a construction of a, of a highway system right in front of the bills on, uh, right in front of those buildings on the waterfront, a 12-lane freeway, it would have been very ugly, uh, and the mayor uh, insisted on putting in a light rail system. This is one of the new, uh, and, and we'll talk about this later, but one of the uh, advantages in, in the, uh, of the renaissance of streetcars, and we're seeing more and more of this in the United States, including very soon in Washington, D.C., where we ripped up the streetcars uh, with, the, with the push to, to put buses in cities. Uh, now streetcars are coming back. What's beautiful about this particular streetcar 
is the, there's no catenary wires above, above ground wires. It's all uh, operated underneath the ground. That's the way the DC streetcar system uh, will operate. Uh, and the impact in the city has been enormous, uh, including uh, seeing the city by rail, uh, the friendliness, the ability to uh, change modes, and the integration of all of these other modes. Uh, just quickly about New Orleans, Karen uh, mentioned that we, we did something very unique in, in New Orleans. Uh, we became the first company in the U.S. To, to privatize the operation of the public transit system. So we are, in fact, the public transit agency uh, in the city. Uh, Post-Katrina, the city and the system was devastated. It was already enormously inefficient with the highest operating costs in the United States and the lowest operating performance. Uh, we convinced the mayor uh, to, to uh, let us, to put out a bid. Uh, Booz Allen did a study uh, and, uh, and the city decided to put out a bid to privatize the system. Uh, we convinced the city that we would be able to secure funds to expand that streetcar system. We received $100 million of state and federal financing, one of the first Tiger grants uh, to expand the streetcar, and last year we, we opened the uh, uh, new streetcar uh, expansion just in time for the Super Bowl, uh, and we've completely revamped uh, the system. And moving on to uh, an issue I'm sure you're in, you'll be interested in, and that is the, the impact of data and, and open data, uh, not only for, for devices and smartphones and how people are able to navigate a myriad of transportation services, whether it be sedans like Uber, taxis, uh, or uh, buses. But here's the impact when cities choose to open up their data. In the case of, in the case of the T in Boston, uh, they decided to open their data uh, to, uh, for developers to have access to the data of what was happening with the train system. So within one hour, a developer in integrated the trial data into the Google Earth into Google Earth to show the real-time locations of the buses. Within two days, developer integrated the trial data into a free, uh, easily accessible uh, web page where T-Riders could track the buses uh, from any uh, internet accessible computer. Within one week, a developer built a desktop that displays the countdown information for the rider's favorite stop. Within two weeks, a, a simple uh, web app was built that displays bus countdown information without the need for a map. Uh, within five weeks, a developer built iPhone and Android apps that integrate to the real-time data, and the apps cost 99 cents. And within eight weeks, the developer built a system that delivers real-time data by text message to any mobile phone. So, uh, so you can see that, uh, that more uh, apps continue. And frankly, in the case of the T, uh, this was done a couple years ago, so the speed to market uh, has improved uh, significantly since that time. I'll wrap up with uh, what's happening in terms of innovation. How many of you are familiar with Uber? Yeah, so uh, Uber just did a, a fundraising round. Uh, they uh, just got $362 million at a $3 billion valuation, one of the highest ever. Uh, Google uh, was one of the, Google Ventures was one of the uh, leaders of that round. Uh, we uh, have a competing product that we are founders of called Taxi Magic. We'll talk about more about it later. Uh, but what's, uh, what's clear is that uh, people are looking for a change. Uh, the, the big change here, the in, what, what innovation uh, has, uh, has occurred here, is to change the dynamic from uh, the, the taxi company, of which we run about 14 cab companies, uh, delivering the service and, and uh, providing the service, and the customer uh, not being in control, the customer calling for a cab, waiting for the cab, and, and wondering if the cab will show, to the customer be, being in control with a transparent application that shows where the vehicles are, and for the individual drivers to optimize the, their uh, productivity uh, by uh, matching the closest vehicle with the closest rider. Uh, so this is a, a way of, uh, of disrupting uh, the taxi industry, and there are certainly others that are now disrupting Uber. But it's also a way of really significantly uh, improving service, which is uh, what that's all about. Just a quick word on what's happening in terms of innovation and disruption. Uh, it's, from, it's happening at a space, we have a business, a uh, taxi business that's 100 years old. Uh, I've been in the business for more than 30 years. In the last three years, I've seen more change than in the, in the 30 years. 
uh, and, uh, and we have been an early adopter, early adopter uh, years ago with uh, being the first to put two-way radios in vehicles, the first to put cellular phones in limousines, the first to put mobile data terminals uh, in taxi cabs, uh, and now the rate of change is happening uh, at an incredible speed. And so you're seeing disruption of the rental car business with, with uh, you know about the zip car. You're seeing disruption of zip car with cars to go. How many of you are you familiar with cars to go? So instead of renting a car by the hour, you can rent a car by the minute. You pick it up, you drop it off, and you leave it, and you, uh, you look for an, on your app to see where the car is, and you find it, it's, and it can be anywhere in your market. How many of you are familiar with Lyft and Sidecar? So some are familiar with that. That disrupts uh, Uber. That's using private cars uh, as taxis. Uh, whether it's legal or not is still a uh, subject of debate. But uh, it's interesting in terms of uh, the shared economy uh, and collaborative consumption because people are driving their private cars and picking people up for a donation ride. Uh, you, you know, we, we used to call donation rides uh, gypsies or hackers, uh, but uh, today it's a donation ride. So uh, we're going to see where it goes, but it's an, it's an ingenious approach because uh, matching supply and demand is one of the key issues uh, in transportation. So uh, right now uh, in the world's population, Five, over five billion people have access to a cell phone. That doesn't mean that everyone owns a cell phone, but five billion people have access to a cell phone. Uh, by 2000, and uh, last year in 2012, 1.75 billion mobile phones were sold. By 2016, two thirds of all phones will be smartphones. Uh, and uh, by 2015, 7.5 billion people will have access to uh, phones. So what we can see, especially in the developing world, is people have leapfrogged uh, landlines uh, by having uh, cell phones going off the grid. We're also seeing who, other ways of going off the grid, uh, whether it's solar or other things. But that leapfrogging uh, can teach us about new ways of transportation, because if everything is going to be done by smartphones, then you can think about the impact uh, on transportation. And the ability to connect uh, all types of modes of service is one of the key uh, enablers of this technology. Uh, just quickly on the uh, self-driving car, uh, you know, Google uh, and others claim that, uh, that in five years you'll see uh, a high degree of use. Do you know how many states have legalized uh, driverless vehicles? Four states have legalized driverless uh, vehicles. Uh, uh, California, Nevada, Florida, and I forgot uh, the other one. Uh, I've, we've talked and done work with Google on this subject. Uh, it makes a lot of sense, frankly, in, right now in gated communities in Florida, uh, but uh, they believe, people believe that uh, in five years you'll see uh, driverless cars. Our particular level of interest is about safety and what we can learn from this in terms of if you can make a driverless vehicle safe. The, the, the Google car has gone over 500,000 miles without an accident. Uh, it is inevitable that there will be accidents. Uh, it's not completely foolproof. And the lasers are, are kind of dangerous uh, that they use from a safety perspective. But it's a very interesting thing and how this will have impact uh, on our society. One of the most interesting ones, and, and we looked at this business uh, some years ago to be in the, in the bike share business. Uh, I was concerned about liability. Uh, but uh, it started off as sort of a novelty, uh, in my mind, a novelty uh, service. Uh, and it was done as a trade-off in Paris, Velib, uh, for Deco, the company, the, uh, the, uh, P the advertising firm, uh, in order to renew their, light, their uh, billboard uh, permit in Paris, they agreed to invest $20 million in bike share. Uh, it's now moved to something that's very, very important, which taxis still continue to play a key role on, which is the last mile solution. In order to have vibrant, ex healthy uh, transportation systems, you need to solve the last mile problem. And that is any fixed route train, any fixed route bus, uh, when you get off, how do you solve that? My son, who is a late adopter, even though he's uh, only 22, a late adopter to public transportation. He's an early adopter to many other things. But in public transportation, uh, he is uh, slow to move to, to this. But he impressed me recently because he moved back to Washington, got an apartment, and when he uses the metro, he now gets off the metro and rides the bike 
10 blocks from the metro station to his apartment. So it's a perfect example uh, of how you can uh, get someone out of a car. Uh, another big change for me is my generation, when we uh, graduated uh, college, the first major purchase that we wanted to make was for what? A car. All of us wanted a car. Today, the first major purchase is a smartphone, and then the next purchase is restaurant expense. Uh, <laughs> lots of restaurants. So uh, the, the issue is he's not interested in a car, uh, even though I offered to get him one. Uh, that's not something he's interested in. And this is, a this is a good reason why. How do we get people out of their cars into buses? We try to make it cool. This is uh, CO2 light, uh, but we're really promoting uh, getting people out of their cars and thinking, uh, trying to attract uh, other people who are not thinking about buses to ride buses. And I will uh, end on uh, this. OK, thank you. Thanks, Mark, for setting the, 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 the stage there. Um, I'm going to ask Bill to provide some maybe local bottom-up perspective on uh, getting people out of their cars. And in particular, if you can just tell us a little bit about the taxi systems and how that actually works. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I want to thank Jim and Elena for inviting me back here uh, two years ago. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking here along with Mark Klein, who unfortunately couldn't make it today. Um, and we introduced um, the, uh, the taxi business model, but we also at that time introduced the um, uh, natural gas component of a new vehicle that was being uh, made called the MV1. And that was for, basically for our reason for purchasing that was the, um, the uh, wheelchair accessible transportation. So uh, thanks again for having me back. And I'm going to we actually touch on more of a continuation of that. But first, I thought what I would do is, uh, Mark gave a, a great, great um, presentation on, on the larger scale uh, transportation um, systems and, and issues. And I thought that I would start by uh, basically just giving you an inside look at, at our industry from the, the taxi standpoint and, and locally right here in New Haven. Um, Metro Taxi was, actually we're 26 years old this month. Uh, it's a family run business. My wife, Isabel, is here with me. Uh, she's vice president of our company and we run it together. Um, uh, and locally we produce about one and a half million passenger trips per year, which is roughly 4,000 uh, per day. We transport, and, and of that 4,000 per day, there's typically about 800 advanced reservations. So mostly where our demand responsive transportation. And in our view, uh, as Mark was saying about the last mile, uh, demand response is really what our niche is and also where a lot of difficulty arises in providing a streamlined service. Uh, reservations are easier to, uh, to comply with. Advanced or de uh, demand response is a little more difficult. Uh, we offer taxi service. We offer black car ser uh, service. We have a large student transportation service. We do medical livery trips, uh, taxi top advertising and also uh, service to all the tri-state airports. Um, I thought what I would do is give a brief dis description. This is really where the technology piece comes in that isn't so well known about our industry because I, I think that many of us tend to think of the taxi industry as, as where it used to be years ago. And right now, uh, were you to walk into our call center, you'd see a very, very high-tech environment. You'd see phone operators on one end of the room, all with computers, um, uh, taking, taking reservations for service. Um, and within that, we, uh, in order to facilitate that service, 85% of the trips that you all may call in just come into our company and go right out without any dispatcher intervention at all. It's simply satellite tracking, selects the closest cab, it, the closest available cab, offers that cab to a driver, the driver accepts it, and you're picked up. And, and it really is a, a way to streamline our business, and quite frankly, when we did that years ago in 1998, it, our business really, really took off because we opened up a huge bottleneck. Um, and dispatchers basically are uh, sitting behind a, a bank of computers, and they can literally see every single vehicle that we own, uh, what street it's on. They can tell how fast it's going. Uh, most of our vehicles right now have in-vehicle cameras, and although we can't view 
from inside our office what that looks like. Uh, the cameras are, are uh, we, we can't pick up an indication from a camera when there's some erratic driving behavior. And that I'll alert the dispatcher that there's either a hard braking situation, it may be an accident, or something that we can retrain our drivers on. But the bottom line is that we're really able to micromanage our fleet in a way that we've never ever been able to do before, which has really produced what you all would like uh, the most of is, is a better and higher quality service. Um, so how do the customers access that service? Well, you know, we have a phone, all sevens, and hopefully you're familiar with that number. Um, but, you know, me, the, the, the amount of people that are calling us on the phone is declining rapidly. You know, we have an intelligent voice recognition system where you don't have to speak to one of our operators. We offer our own Android uh, apps, both iPhone and Android. Um, and in that regard, you can watch your vehicle come to you much the same way as Mark spoke about Uber a short while ago. Um, we have web booking, which a lot of our corporate accounts do. So there's a lot of different ways to, there, that are facilitating and making it easier for you to access our service. And again, this is common with large scale transportation, what I refer to as full service transportation and taxi companies. Uh, these are all common technologies that we're all embracing. One of the things that makes it difficult for us, um, oh, it, actually before I go there, once the job is dispatched, you also get a, a, a text message on your, your cell phone, which tells you uh, it, your job is accepted by a cab, it gives you the taxi number, um, and if you've used the app, then you can follow the taxi as it approaches to you. But in either way, you get a notification when your trip was accepted, and you get uh, an on-site, when the call is out front, you get an on-site phone call letting you know that your car is out front. So all of these things are meant to make it faster and easier for you to use the, the, the taxis in this industry. Um, what that involves, though, is all the things that I just mentioned to you, and this is where some of the big challenges of our industry come in, all of those technologies are not, not owned by one particular uh, company or entity. So our biggest challenge from Metro Taxi standpoint was to, was to really marry those all together to form a cohesive, you know, start to finish uh, technology solution for our, for our industry um, that, was, that, that really facilitates good service. And that's the problem. So you have a dispatch company that's not talking to your phone system, that's not talking to the, the app, that's not talking to all those, the IVR system, and all those different technologies had to come together. So that is one of our, our larger challenges, and we've been able to kind of swim those waters for a while now. Um, but, but our success in doing that has led us to another part of our business that, that has actually taken off very well, and we actually dispatch to, right now, three other cities from our location, our headquarters in West Haven. So we're dispatching over 1,000 taxi cabs in Chicago, uh, in Philadelphia, and also uh, in Manhattan, where we have a contract to provide accessible dispatch service, which we'll talk about a little bit later on the mobility portion of this. But it's opened up avenues to us that we never would have been able to do before because literally if somebody's sitting there dispatching vehicles in our location, it's just as easy to do it in West Haven as it is in downtown Chicago or in downtown Manhattan. So it's been a real avenue and a door opener for us. Um, but of course, our, our biggest thing is why are customers calling us and all hinges around service response times. And I think that's what part of, the con part of our conversation is all about because it's that service reliability that enables uh, you all to uh, access our service and be able to rely on the fact that you're gonna get to where you're going when you need it. Um, two of our big biggest projects I'm just gonna touch on um, slightly because I think we'll have more conversation on those. One has been our fueling uh, project. Two thirds of our vehicles right now run on compressed natural gas, um, which has done great, great things for our company, for our drivers, for the air quality around us. And the other thing that happened during, during our migration to natural gas is it opened up a whole door to us, which was a, a really a, a challenge that we've been trying to get taken care of for years, and that was to be able to provide demand response, uh, wheelchair accessible taxi service to a, um, a community that, that, that so, so very much needs that service, has needed it forever, continues to need it, and, it, and as we go into future um, with the aging uh, baby boomer population is gonna be even more dependent upon that. So, I don't know if I went too fast, uh, there's a lot in there, there's a lot to this industry, and hopefully it's a little bit different than what you may have uh, initially imagined. Great, thanks, Bill. Well, 
Um, before I open the floor up for uh, questions uh, from the audience, I, I'd like to just ask one question uh, to the two of you. I mean, it seems that, that one of the themes around transportation is that people don't, other than your Sunday drive in the car, I mean, generally people don't want transportation for its sake. What they really want is accessibility, right? They want access to services. They want uh, access to uh, get to their jobs or um, to uh, some kind of uh, location. They want the, it's really accessibility. Um, and what I heard this morning from both of you is that there seems to be a lot of innovation, that this uh, industry is actually quite decentralized, whether it's uh, around the technologies to link supply and demand. Um, I'd like to hear from both of your perspectives what you think are the necessary governance or institutional landscapes that enable those innovations. So, you know, Uber and, and Lyft and uh, innovations in, let's say, fuel technologies. Will those take place in a particular governance and institutional landscape, right? At the local level, at the national level. Um, and, and what we've been hearing a lot about in terms of transforming transportation is really, on the one hand, uh, transforming or improving existing technologies, that's more like marginal changes, or a wholesale transformation of transportation, transportation infrastructure. But, but we know that there needs to be a, an enabling landscape, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what that enabling landscape looks like. Or maybe, what are obstacles to, uh, to those innovations? You can go ahead. I think that as, as far as uh, the enabling landscape, um, in, in, in the taxi industry, it's always been uh, driven by uh, the demand. And, and that demand changes from day to day. It changes literally from, from, from hour to hour. Um, and I think that, that what has driven uh, my company and, and our industry, well, in Connecticut and, and all over the place, is how do we meet that demand um, and do it in a way that it's affordable and that it's reliable? Um, so the innovations that we've seen on the, on the presentation that Mark did through Uber and through the other uh, Lyft companies, um, our industry has always been doing that. And, and, and as, as Mark said, we're the innovators for the uh, computerized dispatch, the data dispatch. And we've also been the, the innovators for exactly the type of um, uh, phone apps and technology that they're using now. So we've had those before and we continue to grow those. Um, I think. I think that the industry itself um, produces that. I think it keeps up with it. I think that uh, the other companies may have found a niche that, that has a, a broader, broader breadth to it because they contract directly with a driver rather than go through a central dispatch. But I think all in all, our technology um, and our innovations have only been limited by our own ability yeah. to weave that into um, the, uh, the uh, very highly uh, capital intensive structure that we already exist in and just trying to move forward in, in the best way that we can. And I, I think largely the industry has been successful in doing it. Mm -hmm. I would uh, say that, the, the, first of all, the question is a very important one, but it's also a very broad one because there are so many different modes of transportation. So one uh, solution from a regulatory standpoint uh, may apply to one mode but not uh, to another. Um, if you think about, for instance, bike share, uh, you don't see five different uh, companies generally competing uh, for bike share in a market. You see the, a, uh, a uh, municipality uh, licensing uh, a, a, that real estate uh, in the city uh, to have the scale uh, and the coordination. It's a complicated, even though it's a simple uh, basically simple technology in terms of putting bikes out there. Uh, the logistics of managing a, a bike share program are, are not uh, quite that simple. But having sufficient number of locations to serve uh, a community is important. So, uh, and in order to attract the investment, uh, there, have been, uh, there have been deals that are made to structure that. Uh, from a, a regulatory standpoint, uh, I think, one of the keys is to look at development and where development is occurring in cities and where uh, visionary leaders want to see development occur. We see you know, the broad uh, trends of, of, of people moving back into cities. Interestingly enough, uh, the people who are moving back into cities in the United States are both older people and young people. 
Um, and so how do, how do leaders solve uh, the problems from a regulatory standpoint in terms of de licensing or developing uh, uh, new uh, programs? It, it's very difficult to take away street, streets for bike lanes, very controversial, it takes leadership to do that. Uh, to do BRT, it's even tougher to have dedicated lanes. Um, and there are all kinds of ideas of taking the shoulder of highways and, and, and building lanes on the shoulders. Um, as far as the disruption that Bill was speaking of, uh, the interesting, the sort of dirty little secret on that one is that the, that the, the disruptors have said, to hell with the regulators, uh, we're going to try it and then let them go after us and let's see if we can get. And it's an interesting strategy and for the most part, for a, for a significant part it's worked to say let them chase us and we'll, by the time they, they get us, uh, we'll have enough of a following that we'll be able to, uh, to lobby and to, to fight. So it's a combination of, of deep pocket, uh, highly paid um, lobbyists as well as uh, grassroots uh, advocates. But I would say you have to really think about which mode you want to uh, talk about and, uh, but the, and there are different uh, regulatory approaches to each. Okay. Well, I see a lot of folks with their hands ready to go up. So why don't I open the floor for discussion? We have about 15 minutes and we have someone with a microphone up here. Okay. Yes. If you guys could state your affiliation and name before asking the question, that would be great. So, hands? I saw Any a questions? few on the right hand side. That is. Oh, there we go. Um, my name is Allison Joseph. That's my dad. Um, <laughs> and I'm um, a first year student at SOM. And so, uh, to follow up on that question, I would ask specifically we've talked a little bit about energy um, and clean energy. And I would ask on the electric issue um, do you see the leadership? to, you know, I, obviously one of the big challenges with electric cars is charging stations and there's a whole infrastructure that goes with that. Um, both for private usage of electric cars and in public transportation, do you see that going anywhere or are we sort of in the natural gas right now? What's, what's the future there? Is there potential for, you know, leadership to, to build that infrastructure? Um. Mark Klein, if he were here today, who's uh, with Clean Energy, which would give the statistics on the natural gas vehicle adoption in, in Europe and elsewhere, which is very impressive. Uh, the, the U.S. is way behind in terms of uh, natural gas uh, vehicles. Uh, Bill is a leader to put his fleet here uh, on natural gas. It's slow to, to develop. Uh, it's the right thing to do for many of uh, many reasons. We have been running natural gas on uh, on uh, our buses uh, for some time. For electric, uh, there uh, it's 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 a two part uh, problem. One is the the cost of the vehicles and the uh, and the battery the battery cost to, to develop those, and we're still. Uh, seen development uh, in that regard to try to bring down those prices that make it something that you'll see widely used. The numbers are not nearly as encouraging as they are in, in alternative fuels like natural gas in terms of widespread adoption because of the battery costs. We, we worked with people like Shai Agassi who uh, I spent time with, with when he was, had raised uh, $800 million for a better place business, which ultimately failed, uh, which was battery switching batteries in vehicles. He couldn't get a manufacturer to manu really manufacture. He got one, but uh, no one in the U.S. Uh, Tesla is a great car. Uh, the price point is coming down. Tesla is, is, is uh, saying that they will have uh, battery switching and they will have uh, a lot of stations. But in terms of impact on transportation industry, we're also talking the Chinese BYD, which Warren Buffett has a, has a uh, investment in. Uh, we are waiting to see whether there's going to be a vehicle at the right price point. And, uh, and for private use, for us, we can build the stations just as Bill has a fueling station for CNG. We can build uh, charging stations. But uh, I think it's going to be a while for electric. Gentleman in the front. 
Uh, I'm Lee Granis, coordinator of Greater Haven Clean Cities. I can give you two examples of where electric vehicles are making some headway, and they're in the commercial uh, heavy-duty vehicles. The Proterra bus, which is a fast-charge electric bus, is about to the point to where they are uh, on the way to becoming a major producer of electric vehicles on their own without government subsidies. It's a $900,000 bus. This hybrid bus is running on the street out here are $650,000. The Delta's, you know, $350,000, $250,000. And because of fuel usage, fuel cost, that Delta is being, you know, closed by electric heavy duty buses. The other vehicles we have operating here in Connecticut by Free LA is a Smith truck. It's a 2600 GVWR box truck that carries potato chips. And they are making money on I just talked to the representatives this weekend, and they're making money on that vehicle because they've sized the vehicle to haul the right commodity. Potato chips don't weigh much, but it all has to do with return on investment and mileage, and it's got to be economically feasible to work. And those two examples are working, and then on the case of the rest of the electric vehicles, the Tesla vehicles making it on credits, and I'm not sure where that's going. Um, and you, but you have to go the miles, and there has to be a return on investment before it's going to be off on its own without being on the government dole. Thanks. My name is Jeff Woodward. I'm a joint degree with the School of Management and School of Forestry here. Uh, Mark, I'm curious from your perspective. What needs to happen, both in terms of marketing and in terms of system performance, to change the public perception of riding a bus in the U.S.? Well, you know, uh, it, first, uh, the problem for many bus systems are that people don't know where they go. Uh, a, a train, a fixed rail, people feel safe getting on a bus and, and knowing where it goes. Uh, we have examples of uh, bus systems in Las Vegas. Uh, the bus system on the Strip is, is, uh, is one of the few systems, uh, maybe the only system in the United States, that actually along the Strip, the double-decker bus, uh, that can pay for itself. The fare box recovery on bus systems in the United States is about 40 percent struggle, cities struggle to get 40 percent fare box recovery. Uh, to pay for the operation of a bus system, so at least 60 percent is subsidized. Uh, but that one, that particular service is, is popular with tourists. In many cities like Baltimore, we run the downtown circulator. It, it's a free bus that is used by all kinds of, of folks, working folks, students, uh, inner city residents, enormously popular because it has a very limited route uh, in the downtown area. More and more cities are adopting circulator buses that have limited routes and are, are very popular. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, one will be a change of route design. And this is another question to, to Karen's point in terms of where, where you said about people commuting from uh, into the city. A lot of our si systems were designed hub and spoke. Everything went into the city and then back out. Now there's a lot of commuting from suburb to suburb even. So new route design and, and buses are flexible to do that. They're much easier to change a route design on a bus than it is on a, on a rail, which is impossible, uh, other than adding new rail. Route design, uh, apps are going to be, uh, are gonna be a, a way of navigating these services and, and seeing where you can get on a bus, where you can get off a bus. More and more of these apps are starting to show when the bus is coming, uh, and, and where you're going. And then a lot of it is just marketing and get it. The more people get out of their cars, they're more they're willing to try uh, other services. And we see new types of bus services and we're working on some uh, to bring new services to cities that, uh, that haven't been done yet uh, in, or haven't been done in years in the U.S. So it's a little bit of back to the future. There was a question in the back, woman in the back. Yeah. Hello, I'm Ann Stris Farwell. I'm with the New Haven Urban Design League. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the pros and cons of transit authorities versus privatizing, and then related to that is probably a question of scale, both of um, ridership population and region. The, the rider, I heard the first part. The second part on the ridership was hard to hear. I'm sorry. Um, I'm guessing that 
related to the question of um, a transit authority versus privatizing would also be the scale of use, your market. Mm -hmm. I'm on, on this one, uh, the, the first, there are some very well-run public transit systems in the United States that uh, are well-run and well-funded and are innovative. And so uh, I don't think you're going to see widespread privatization of the majority of uh, bus systems. Uh, where privatization is, is an enormous advantage is when a system is struggling, when there are problems, when they don't have the resources uh, or the ability to fix. For us, we have over 200 contracts across the country. And so our head of marketing was the president of the Discovery Channel. Uh, we can apply resources to, to New Orleans or to Nassau County or to other uh, other locations in terms of marketing or marketing support that no one uh, location would have or have those, uh, those resources locally. Uh, there's another aspect of, in terms of being a change agent uh, to help bring the best of local, uh, regional, and international talent to change. One of the misnomers of privatization, and there are, uh, there are strong opposition to privatization, the, the primary opposition is either labor unions or, uh, or some of the, uh, the bureaucrats who are responsible to manage uh, these systems. Uh, so there, is, and some of the concerns are legitimate, but the biggest concern, which is really a misnomer, is the idea that you're selling off the assets and you're giving up the assets and that you're selling the future. That has happened if you sell a toll road or you sell a, the parking meters in cities and what you're really doing is, is getting the present value of those assets and getting the cash, the, a cash strapped city gets the advantage of selling the assets, getting the cash up front and then the private sector uh, manages it for the future. And, there, and that can be risky selling off the asset. Uh, but there can be an advantage because the private sector can do something, for instance, in toll roads, in marketing or pricing that maybe the public sector would have trouble doing because it might not be popular. Uh, in the case of running uh, the buses uh, for New Orleans or the streetcars, they're not selling off the asset. We are managing the asset. So if the city is not happy with the way we're managing it and the value we're creating, then they can take back the asset and bring it back in-house or look for another operator. That's a, a big advantage. And one of the things to the ridership question is we align incentives with the, with the uh, city and the region to grow ridership. So we take risk, we, which is not something that the, that the public agency is accustomed to. We say uh, if we can grow ridership, then we'll have incentives uh, to grow that ridership because we can participate and we can put out more service. If ridership drops, we have disincentives. So uh, there's a level of accountability that doesn't exist uh, under the current, uh, un under a publicly run uh, system. There was one other question in the back. Yes. Uh, hello and thank you. I'm Francis Sawyer. I'm a MESC at FES and was just wondering how the transportation options that cities are looking at are changing with the uh, changing demographics of poverty and the um, sort of geographical uh, outlay of poverty. So like suburbs are increasingly showing the highest gains in uh, the poor population while a lot of denser urban areas are being gentrified. And how is that changing whether people are going to trolleys or streetcars versus buses? And how do you provide services for transit dependent communities who are increasingly further and further from the jobs in the city? Mm -hmm. Well, from our perspective, you've identified a very, very large part of our transportation within the Greater New Haven area, and that is the lower income neighborhoods. So we, we've have, we have actually a very, very good blend of clients, and they go you know, from, from commuting uh, passengers to lower income housing to tourists uh, and to people going to work every single day. Um, but we, but, but a lot of people depend on exactly what you just said is, is lower income uh, demand response transportation service. Um, but I also, I also want to say that um, from our perspective, we, we are a small piece of the transportation and, and Mark referred to it was, as the last mile, but, but we are really, um, 
uh, a, a service that facilitates everybody's needs from, you know, for instance, we service all the transportation hubs, so somebody in a lower income area may need uh, a short ride, like a three quarter mile ride, just to get to the bus service. That's what they rely on us for. Um, somebody to get to the train station. So we, we're feeder, we act as a feeder service to all those transportation hubs. And largely, uh, the good base of our work that has been one of the things that, that have made our company successful is exactly that population. Um, I, I think that I, I think that as as they get stretched, uh, which is what you suggested, you know, more and more on, on their budgets, I think that that tends to push a lot of people back into a carless situation, and that results in uh, better, better utilization of mass transit, to which we offer that small piece. I just add uh, one thing that. We talk about the, the movement back to cities, and, and that movement to cities is, is both young and old, and the old uh, are, uh, are increasingly dependent on transportation services like what uh, Bill operates, uh, paratransit services. He does it with flexible vehicles, with these MV1 vehicles that can take people who, uh, who are ambulatory as well as people who are uh, in wheelchairs in these vehicles. Uh, what we are seeing is a change in, uh, in, because of that demographic, there are new opportunities with the uh, aging population. Uh, Jim Boyle, who's here, who's in charge of the Entrepreneurial Institute, was talking about what are the big problems to solve for healthcare in this country, and more and more of the service is outpatient service. Uh, so if you keep people out of the hospital, uh, but you need to do preventative care, how do you accommodate those folks in transportation systems who are aging with health care providers who want to uh, who want to have service, high cost service, but on an outpatient basis? It increases the opportunity for transportation. And you know, just one other thing on that is that the um, one of the biggest pushes in Connecticut from the, from the governor's standpoint has, has been to take uh, the aging population out of nursing homes and put them back into homes where they're self sufficient, and many of them can do that, except for there's that big transportation component. They can't get out and travel whenever they want to, and that really is, is one of the, got the pushing factors of us creating these, this uh, massive, what I consider massive, uh, wheelchair accessible demand response transportation. So somebody either in a wheelchair or let's just say they use a, a, a walker, I mean, it's far easier to move up and down one of our ramps to get in the vehicle than it is stepping up into a van or sinking down into a Crown Victoria that you can't get out of because it, it's just not conducive for that. So uh, that is that 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 right there, the accessible transportation is becoming a very very large part of our of our uh, client base. And when Bill's drivers and my drivers figure out how to take their blood pressure and make sure that they take their medicine, we'll really have a, a great business there because we'll go out there and transport them, but we'll also take care of their home health care. Okay, we have time for one more question. There is a woman up in the front with a green shirt with a question. Yeah. Oh, actually, their microphone is on its way. Yep. Hi, I'm, I'm Melinda Tuhus. Um, I'm an activist with um, Elm City Cycling, which promotes cycling as transportation and, and recreation. But I actually, I had a question for Mark about um, the light rail. And my understanding, in, in Jerusalem, that Veolia built a light rail that brings people from the settlements in the West Bank into the city, and it's very controversial, mm -hmm. and people from the West, West Bank cannot use it. And I was um, reading some background material that Veolia was set to sell it or you know, get out of that business, but as of April of this year, what you still, Veolia still owned it. I don't know if you're connected to that piece of it, or could you just explain that and what What's going on with, with that light rail system? Sure. Uh, I'm not an expert on it because I don't uh, operate that. It's not in my uh, area. But uh, we do have a, a light rail system uh, that is in Jerusalem. Uh, it does serve both uh, folks who are in the uh, settlements and uh, other parts of Jerusalem. It is uh, not operated on some discriminatory basis where it only takes uh, Israeli citizens. The more controversial issue was a bus system and a bus system that was operated that uh, went into the settlements uh, and uh, so some uh, were concerned about the, that, that it served the settlements 
uh, and in fact, uh, Viola has sold that uh, bus system in the last uh, month. But uh, it's a subject that uh, I would be happy to discuss. There are a lot of pol political questions about that, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you uh, afterwards. Are you just for clarification, you're saying that the light rail system is open to anyone? That's correct. That's correct. Well, one of the other themes that I've caught from this afternoon's discussion is the, the theme of getting people out of their cars and, uh, 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 and, and getting them into taxis or alternative modes of transportation. And our choice of transportation, um, a lot of people think, is income driven, but also the research shows that cities and countries with very similar levels of income actually have very different uh, preferences for uh, uh, transportation that our choice of transportation is really uh, shaped by social norms. And it seems that one of the things that we're really seeing in the last five, ten years, uh, major shifts in social norms around transportation, bike sharing, uh, use of uh, uh, taxis and, and other types of transportation. So I think what we're going to see in the next 10, 20, 30 years, certainly in the U.S. and in developing countries, is uh, new opportunities for innovation in this area and in this industry. So. I want to thank uh, both Mark and Bill, and, and please join me in uh, thanking them for their insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting area to be in, working. Thank you.